Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second of four lectures for the Disability Movement Etc. series. I'm your host, Dr. Andy, and I am broadcasting today from my home office that I get to share with my amazingly artistic spouse and partner. And I'm here in Denton, Texas, which sits in occupied land of a Wichita and Caddo affiliated tribes. Uh, I'm a white male. I use he, him pronouns. I have blonde hair, which is cut short at the moment, um, though it is a little bit longer on top and occasionally you might see my cowlick coming through. Uh, I am wearing um, my Accessibility Matter shirt, and I know you can't see all of that, but I think it's an apt shirt to wear for the conversation today uh, that I'm very excited to have. Uh, but before I do, I'd like to welcome everybody, especially those of you who are tuning in for the first time. Um, I'm really glad that you found the show and hopefully you enjoy our conversation today. Um, in essence, Disability Movement, Etc. is a show that I'm, I'm trying to put together and, and bring activists, community uh, partners with scholars together in order to try to make sure that accessibility is a priority when we're talking about disabled folks and their um, experiences trying to be physically active. And so if you wanna join the conversation, feel free to drop things in the chat, uh, or you can use the hashtag uh, dismove, et cetera, on uh, Twitter. And with that, I'd love to invite our second guest, which um, is Siren Nagakairi. Now, Siren is an activist, writer, consultant, and outdoor enthusiast. Uh, as the founder of Disabled Hikers, they have become an advocate, an expert voice in making the outdoors more inclusive and accessible for the disabled community and others that are underrepresented. Siren grew up with multiple disabilities and chronic illnesses, including Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. That's a lot to say on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, they have also lived with depression, anxiety, and CPTSD. In their mid-20s, when Siren started hiking and exploring what their body could do and couldn't do in the outdoors, they found a lack of infrastructure, support, and resources for the disabled community. So Siren founded Disabled Hikers in 2018 with four main goals, organizing group hikes, celebrating disabled people's experiences, facilitating those experiences by making specific information available, and advocating for change in the outdoors. Siren is now working on a hiking guide uh, for disabled hikers with Falcon Guides, who is a lead publisher of guidebooks. I'm sure if you have spent any time in the outdoors and you've bought any guidebook, you know exactly who they are. So with that, I would like to welcome Siren on. Thank you so much, Siren, for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, appreciate it. It's on a Wednesday. Hopefully the weather is better where you are uh, than it is for me. It's a little bit chilly here in Texas, but that's all perspective. <laughs> So, um, Siren, and for you and for, for those of listening, um, this show is kind of is broken up into three general parts. So the first one, I'm going to ask you to share experiences, um, a story, a personal narrative about you attempting to be active as a disabled person. And after that, then you and I will have a little back and forth and some Q&A, and then if folks who are watching, if they want to jump in and ask some questions, we'll filter those in as well. So are you ready? Yeah, we're ready to go. All right, here we go. So I will turn it over to you. The floor is yours, Siren. Great, thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm Siren Nagakiri, they, them pronouns, and I am a white non-binary person with uh, medium brown hair. I'm wearing a rust colored jacket and behind me is just kind of a scene of my house as so many of us are um, continuing to work from home, which for me has been great and um, really has opened up a lot of opportunities for me, which I really appreciate. Um, yeah, so I um, uh, started Disabled Hikers in 2018. And um, as you mentioned, I really have um, experienced a lot of barriers to access in the outdoors for the majority of my life and have felt very excluded from outdoor recreation. Um, Really, it started in grade school, in college, in high school, you know, as I um, started getting older in early adulthood and just continually met obstacles and a lack of understanding and acceptance about what 
my needs were in the outdoors, the kind of information that I needed, the kind of support that I needed. Um, you know, and there's, of course, so many examples of that in my life. But um, I think a couple that I would really um, like to highlight is so uh, in community college, I, um, of course, was engaged in a, took a, um, like an earth science course. And we um, had the opportunity to take a trip to um, the Grand Canyon. And I grew up in Florida. So this was like, of course, could have been the other side of the world to me. I had never left the state, never gone anywhere before in my life. And this was like the first opportunity for me to really explore a new place. And um, the trip just went so horribly for me. Um, the, you know, the professor really didn't understand what I needed, didn't ask me any questions about what I needed to be able to engage in the material or in the trip and with my other classmates. So I often found myself just like sitting on a bench at a viewpoint while everyone else went off and had this amazing experience. And, you know, I always tried to, of course, make the best out of it. And just, I felt like it gave me an opportunity to really just kind of be in in that moment and experience what whatever it was that I could um, in the way that, you know, in the way that I could. So after that experience, I did feel like I had, um, a different kind of connection with that place at the time than perhaps my other classmates did who were all busy running from here to there and you know trying to get this done and that done meanwhile i spent a lot of time just kind of sitting there and enjoying the space and the place um so that um really kind of created a real sense of meaning and purpose for me um and then that kind of continued of course as i grew older and I engaged in some more um, educational opportunities, including I um, went to a herbal training program where we spent a lot of time outdoors and things like that. Um, but the inspiration for disabled hikers really came after I moved to uh, Northwest Washington State to the Olympic Peninsula, um, which is where Olympic National Park is located. And um, it's a stunning area. Um, you know, it's old growth rainforest, like the really the last remaining temperate rainforest in the continental United States. Um, and it's just a stunning place. So I was out, you know, just getting to know this new place. And, um, and I went out on a hike in um, the National Forest. That was a um, section of a trail of a, you know, a, in a system that I was already kind of familiar with, but I hadn't hiked this particular trail yet. So I started out and everything that I read about it had said it was easy, there was no obstacles, you know, super easy hike, nothing to worry about. And as soon as I started out on it, there were like multiple really steep stairs, like a really steep drop off, lots of loose rocks, um, steep inclines and all of that. So I, um, you know, it was really kind of dangerous for me um, in a lot of ways, you know, this trail that was supposed to be really easy. Um, and eventually I did make it to my destination, which was this um, bridge over a really stunning waterfall. And I was just exhausted and in pain and just feeling really defeated. Um, but as I kind of, you know, sat down and leaned against the bridge railing and was just watching this waterfall flowing by and just inspiration struck in that moment. I said, why don't I do something about this? You know, I've been having this experience my entire life. Why don't I do something? So I basically went home and threw up a website and started, you know, writing a few things about my experiences and some trail guides. And before I knew it, Disabled Hikers was born and just kind of started taking off. Um, and, you know, here we are. So I'm really proud of it. Um, you know, and it all, it takes a lot of work. And there is, of course, still a lot of work that needs to be done. So, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And um, I mean, I'm sorry to hear of your experiences, but I'm sure they are are not. Um, you know, it's not the exception. I think it's it's sort of the rule, um, and which is very unfortunate. And and particularly for myself, um, I'm also a big outdoor person, and I I find particularly with with my own depression and my own ADHD that. Um, even taking 10, 15 minutes to, to just go for a walk and um, get out into nature, even just to sit, or, or it doesn't have to be anything strenuous, uh, 
it's just so beneficial. But you know, it is a privilege that I I am as able bodied as I am, that I don't necessarily have to um, worry about all the extra stuff, right? The the slope, the incline, the the steepness, um, and so I, I really commend you in order to, to I mean, see this and and start building something from it. I mean, it's very, very cool. Can you talk a little bit, um, you know, about kind of what you've done with disabled hikers since, um, I guess, 2018, so in the last kind of couple of years, and and maybe a little bit about how, you know, the pandemic may have shifted or, or encouraged that, because I know lots of people have, have really taken to the outdoors um, since the pandemic started. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Disabled Hikers started as um, providing trail guides. So mm. I created um, kind of this unique rating system called the Spoon Rating System mm -hmm. that um, is really designed to give like really objective information about yeah. difficulty and accessibility and quality of the trail um, to be, you know, again, much more objective than kind of your typical ratings. Um, right. Yeah. So then I started writing those and um, and just produce, trying to produce a lot of more resources than is what currently available. Um, yeah, and then I, um, of course, uh, we have the social media and started building up more community around that. And I feel like it really gave people um, a lot of opportunity to connect with one another, um, mm -hmm. which is something that is really important. Um, and from there, I started leading group hikes and, um, um, to bring people together in the outdoors and yeah. offer an outdoor experience that was really tailored to people's individual needs and kind of, you know, explore how do we interact with each other? How do we address everyone's needs in yeah. um, the outdoor space? Um, so it's really a, a, I feel like it's a very creative and very understanding environment mm -hmm. um, and offer people a lot of opportunities. Yeah. Um, and, you know, but of course, when the pandemic hit, that actually changed a lot for us. Um, I didn't feel comfortable leading group hikes because, um, you know, a lot of disabled folks are at much greater risk um, with COVID. So we um, hit pause on that. But mm -hmm. it did, I feel like, kind of give um, disabled hikers more of an opportunity to reach out um, kind of beyond the disabled community to the larger mm -hmm. outdoor recreation community because there has been so much more conversation about how do we recreate outdoors when there's kind of this overarching, you know, risk and threat and access needs. And, you know, there is, um, appears to be so many more people recreating out now. So how do we do that in a way that is fair and accessible and who better to answer those questions than disabled folks. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that has really, I feel like provided a, um, kind of helped expand the conversation a little more and, um, give disabled folks a platform that, uh, previously wasn't being provided. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think I want to start our, our little conversation here with talking about what draws you so strongly to to hiking and to being in nature. Yeah, I think for me, it's really just that that being in nature piece. And of course, there's always the question of how do we define nature, right? Mm -hmm. um, is it something that's out there? I don't think it's out there. Mm -hmm. um, it's always here and within us and all around us. Um, yeah. But, you know, growing up as a sick and disabled kid, I, um, and again, I, like I said, I grew up in Florida where it's very hot most of the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I, um, you know, really spent a lot of time just like hanging out in my yard and mm -hmm. watching the birds flying overhead and the bees and, you know, the lizards and all of that, that were just all around me in my yard. Um, yeah you know, again, because I couldn't necessarily get out for those big, those big outdoor experiences. Mm -hmm. So I found it where I could. And that really, I think, created in me um, this, um, you know, it made outdoor experiences really important. Um, yeah. And as I grew up, and I realized that like hiking was a thing um, that I, you know, started um, just trying that out and figuring out for myself, like what I could do, and what I yeah. couldn't do. Um, you know, taking some risks because there wasn't information and resources available for me. For um, sure. Yeah, just figuring it out as I went. Yeah. Are there, outside of hiking, are there any other activities that you really enjoy doing in the outdoors? 
Um, hiking is probably the biggest one. And, yeah. you know, but that for me, that includes like just simple things as, you know, like I said, sitting outside or going for mm -hmm. a picnic or going for a scenic drive, yeah. things like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Hiking, <laughs> hiking can be used pretty synonymously with a lot of different activities. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, now you, you mentioned that sort of the, I guess the catalyst was moving sort of the, to the Pacific Northwest. And I mean, there's certainly no shortage of outdoor opportunities up there unless you're disabled, right? In that case, then the accessibility um, certainly becomes a major factor. So what types of barriers have you faced when you're trying to ac access those outdoor spaces? Um, for sure, a lack of information. Um, everything mm. that is provided um, out there, you know, all of the hiking blogs and the trip reports and the trail apps, all of them are designed assuming that everyone is able-bodied. So there's a real lack of information that considers the variety of ways that people access and enjoy the outdoors. Um, it's really kind of just, you know, one idea. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, a real lack of understanding um, among the outdoor community in general, and even among park rangers and land managers and, and everyone in, kind of in the larger outdoor industry about, you know, again, about the variety of access needs and the variety of, of experiences and bodies. Yeah. And with with your organization with Disabled Hikers, I know we've sort of talked about kind of some of the great things and groups and connections and, and now you working with Falcon Guides in order to um, sort of write the, the Disabled Hikers Guide, right? Mm -hmm. um, when working with those you know, folks who are in the outdoor industry who don't necessarily have understanding of dis disability, how how do you approach those conversations? How do you approach, um, you know, land managers who, you know, they may not know how to make something accessible or, or they might not know that their trail is not as accessible. So how do you, how do you go about doing that? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a challenge for sure. And, you know, I kind of have to approach it on a one, one-on-one -on -one level. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I think, you know, I think a lot of land managers, maybe they're aware, but they don't know how to fix it, or mm -hmm. they don't know how to go about making changes, or they think that accessibility only means one thing. Um, you know, so it just means paving a trail, and then it's all good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, for me, I will often go to a place and kind of do my own site review and, you know, figure out what is working, what isn't working, and then provide that information um, and then work one on one to figure out, like, where where are the changes that can be made? What's the low hanging fruit? Um, mm -hmm. What are the things that would take a little more time and investment to do what would be appropriate for the space? And just starting that conversation about, you know, the different types of access and what that means and how it doesn't have to be a major a major project. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about different types of access, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, you know, again, there's, um, I think in the outdoors, there's a large focus on creating like wheelchair accessible mm -hmm. sites and trails. And, um, but then there's, only, there's just a very one, one idea about even what wheelchair access means. And, but there's a variety of types of wheelchair users, a variety of types of adaptive equipment that is available, experience levels and all of that. So, you know, mm -hmm. not all wheelchair users necessarily need a level paved trail. They may be able to do something a little more rugged, um, yeah. you know, as long as there's, you know, for example, no major barriers in the trail surface and things like that. Um, and then also making sure there's resources available for people who are blind or deaf, um, who are autistic, neurodivergent, have mm -hmm. cognitive or intellectual disabilities, making sure that information that is available is provided in a way that is accessible for them. Mm -hmm. um, make sure there's even just places for people to sit and water available and mm -hmm. you know a good restroom, um, yeah. things like that are all simple ways to really improve access. Absolutely. Um, and so in, all, in your work, you know, what what is it that's still needed, right? I mean, I, I know we've got a long way to go and you've just started, right? But as, as we look at how to make spaces and activities more accessible, you know, I guess, what are those low hanging fruit that those listening could 
if they're a program manager have access or they want to access a trail, what could they do um, to better access their own community trails? Yeah, um, you know, I think um, starting out close to home for me mm -hmm. has been kind of the way that I got got started in this. Um, you know, a lot of, um, you know, like developed state parks and city parks tend to be a little more accessible um, and a little less, you know, rugged in the way that kind of pre presents a lot of accessibility issues. Um, so those are good places to start. Yeah. Um, but I feel like, um, for me, at least a big focus of my work is that it's um, while like the concrete access things are really important, unless we change the culture and the conversation, it's not going to mean a whole lot. You know, it's not a build it and they will come kind of scenario. Mm -hmm. You know, we really have to change the way people think about this. Um, mm. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and to that point, you know, in trying to change culture, um, have you faced any resistance in order to, in, in, in your push for better access? Yeah, I think, um, well, there's, yeah, a lot of resistance. <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, but I think kind of one of the most common ones um, in the outdoor community is this idea that um, building inclusion and access will increase our impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's really not true, but it's also a very entitled perspective, I feel like, um, because, you know, people are already having an impact on the environment. It's just the idea that their impact is normal and acceptable, whereas anyone else's is not. So yeah. I think, um, you know, I like I don't want to go into the wilderness and pave all these trails, um, you know, and like build roads everywhere and all of that. That's not what I'm advocating for. Mm -hmm. It's just thinking about how we create access and how we're including people and the ways that, um, you know, in a lot of ways, creating access actually helps. I mean, it helps everyone and yeah. it can actually reduce our impact in a lot of ways. A well-designed, universally accessible mm -hmm. trail will reduce the impact on that site and on other mm -hmm. locations. So. Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting point um, that you bring up the idea of, of actually using universal design and and considering the trails that we develop um, because one of the conversations I've seen in, in many different ways and in many different spaces is that idea of building things and um, building up natural spaces and I think you summed it up very <laughs> very succinctly right we are already having an impact right what it, doesn't necessarily mean just because we're not having an impact in this one particular area that what we're doing isn't ultimately impacting that nat natural space. Mm -hmm. um, but if we are actually considerate of what's going on and um, the trails we do have, we focus on those and make those, like you said, well-designed, um, well-traversable. Because I've, I mean, I've seen countless examples of a trail where it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a disabled person that can't access it, but it's simply a rocky, rooty trail. And so people will walk around it. So then they start, they just widen the trail and create this alternate path or they, the, the switchback is too steep. So they cut it. And so we end up still having these impact items. Um, and so how, how do we get I mean, I guess, how do we get, maybe you have the answer, maybe you don't, but how do we get folks who are land managers, who are the folks who are, um, you know, at the state parks or, or uh, even local municipal parks, or hopefully at some point our national parks, but how do we get them to understand that accessibility means more than just sort of this one narrow idea? Yeah, I, I wish I had a simple answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> right. You wouldn't be talking to me if you did. You certainly. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think, um, you know, I think it comes down to conversations and mm -hmm. having land managers talk with the disabled people and, yeah. you know, making not only inviting them to the table, but making that table accessible um, for them. You know, yeah. I talk to a lot of people who work um, in kind of these large agencies and they say, well, we invite disabled people to have conversations with us all the time and they don't show up. 
Mm. And I said, well, are you <laughs> making it accessible? <laughs> mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah. exactly. Yeah, there's yeah, the the lack and limit of accessibility is not just in one space, it's it's pervasive, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's definitely a a tackling, at least in my understanding in my in my own work, it's tackling accessibility in all spaces and not just the, you know, the space we may actually want to engage in, right? The space that um, we go for a hike in or the the local recreation center that we want to um, attend. There just, there's so many levels of accessibility issues in all of those items. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the things that have helped you? So what types of supports, maybe for you or even the ones that you've helped others through the community groups, the hiking groups that you've put together, what types of um, supports have been really helpful and, and how can others maybe incorporate that into what they're doing? Um, well, um, I think connecting with other disabled people for sure has mm -hmm. been um, really meaningful for, you know, for my own experience and learning, um, you know, in doing this work. Um, that has been really meaningful for me and just re realizing that I'm not alone and that there are other people trying to figure this out um, has been really, really good. Um, and then I think, you know, mm, I think one of the low hanging fruit things that we mentioned earlier is that information piece and mm -hmm. making sure that the information that is provided is thorough and detailed and accessible. Um, so, you know, like one of the things I love is if I go to a trail or recreation site and there's a, a trail access information sign right there at the trailhead that has yeah. like all the stats of the trail that I need and a map and all of that really mm -hmm. well laid out. Um, that makes it so much more easier to decide if I wanna do the trail right then um, and makes me feel much more confident to be there and like mm -hmm. people have at least really thought about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what types of things have you done for those group outings? So how have you gone about, because um, you know, obviously everybody's access needs are a little bit different. So if you're putting together a group, how do you consider sort of the, the variable needs of that group? Yeah, so it um, starts before I even put the hike together. So I always mm -hmm. try to go out and do a review of that trail mm -hmm. and write up a guide um, or you know, train someone else in that location to do it if I'm going to be traveling there. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that information is provided ahead of time. And then I give people opportunities both when they register and um, then I connect with them one on one to discuss their access needs and anything that they may need to feel safe or comfortable um, in that group experience. Yeah. And then once we all come together, I, everyone has an opportunity to share with the group about their needs if they choose to. Um, and then it's a process of just constantly, you know, checking in with each other mm -hmm. throughout the event and making sure that like no one's being left behind. Everyone is feeling comfortable and safe and having their needs met. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, maybe this is kind of, I guess, maybe an outdoor sort of person thing is, is I've, I found the outdoor community tends to be a little bit more accepting than some others, though we, there obviously there's still issues. But at least when attention is sort of brought to it, it seems there's a shift that folks are going, okay, yeah, that makes sense to me. I didn't realize that before. Or I didn't recognize that before. Um, and particularly being in the Pacific Northwest, there, you know, there's a ton of outdoor opportunities. And I think the culture up there is probably a little bit more accepting than say other parts in the country in terms of providing access. So do you have any advice for those in other parts of the country where, you know, they, they might have or might face a little bit more resistance to that acceptance, what they could do to help them get into the outdoors easier. Yeah. I mean, I think everywhere has its issues, right? Like in the Pacific Northwest, there's still lots of misconceptions. Um, mm -hmm. It's not this idyllic community that a lot of people perceive it to be. Um, you know, I grew yeah. up in the South, like I said, in both issues, both areas have their issues, trust me. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so I think it's really just a matter of, um, you know, mm, I mean, there's no one size fits all solution, right? Like that's um, kind of um, a core part of being disabled. Like everyone has yeah. to figure out their own access needs. Um, but I think, 
you know, starting out small and figuring mm -hmm. out what what works for you, um, and you know, being just try, learning how to be your own self advocate. That doesn't come mm -hmm. naturally, especially when we're told in so many ways that mm -hmm. our needs don't matter. Um, it is definitely a process, but you know, connecting with other disabled folks um, has really helped me in that process. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of that community is available online where you can access it from anywhere. So, yeah. um, you know, just starting to have that conversation and figuring out, you know, how how you can do this for yourself in your own community and, yeah. and getting out there and, and, you know, figuring out how to make that change and have those conversations. Yeah. How can non-disabled outdoor enthusiasts be better allies? Um, believe disabled people when we tell you this is an issue yeah. <laughs> like that shouldn't have to be said but it does <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah and you know and learning more about about access and accessibility mm. and what that means and you know again that when we're advocating for access it doesn't mean that we want to like change everything you know mm. it just means that we want to have our needs met just like everyone else and we have that right so you yeah. know, just figuring out how we do that together. Yeah, exactly. I think I heard it. Um, it wasn't in the context of the outdoors, but in short, it was, you know, disabled people have a right to try everything their able-bodied peers do, right? And it's just a matter of how do we make sure that when you try, you have that access and that support to do so. Um, and that, you know, it might mean that there are, there are certain trails or spaces right, that it might be hard to get up to a 14 thousand foot summit right in mm -hmm. as a wheelchair user but um that certainly doesn't mean that you can't access other spaces um that are in that area and still get the benefit of being outdoors and still you know i think a part of at least for me there's some there's some joy in in the challenge of of, of going to a trail and hiking it and you know and getting the joy of, of completing it right it's not necessarily that you know, I think people may have this misconception that when we talk about accessibility, it's just, oh yeah, it just means easy, right? We want an easy button for everything. And that I, I think there's nuance to that, right? We, we just want folks to be able to try to do that trail and, and barriers that can be eliminated, right? Or, or removed or reduced. I think we have the, the not the right, the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? need right we we have the requirement right to make those changes um in what ways do you think that programs that already exist um how they could whether they're focused on you know helping meet the needs of disabled folks or if they're just just a general outdoor group how might they better um support folks who are disabled to, to maybe join their group or, or just support their own initiatives? Yeah, I think recognizing that, you know, you know disabled folks make up at least, you know, 25% of the population. If you add in chronic mm -hmm. illness, it's 60% of the population. So there are already disabled and chronically ill people engaging with your program. You just may not know it. Um, so when you approach it that way, you know, and realize that you don't have to necessarily change your entire program or anything like that, just you need to rethink how you're doing what you're doing. So um, go in with that assumption that there are disabled people already in your program, that you need to ask everyone about their access needs and mm -hmm. provide an opportunity for everyone to share what it is that they need to be in that space because whether you're disabled or not, you have access needs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. And then um, providing really good information and being flexible um, and understanding that, you know, it's not a one size fits all and you're gonna have to adapt and adjust your program. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, when we think of the outdoor community, it, it tends to be quite small, right? When we sort of, at least in my experience, when I, I have friends who now work in the outdoor community and, and they work for different outdoor companies or, or as freelancers, you realize how really everyone knows everyone else at some point, right? And how do we go from, you know, having a small sort of woven community that has really very 
relatively few examples of you know, disabled individuals in the outdoors, right? We often, um, we, we don't see disabled athletes really marketing skiing or climbing or other sort of outdoor pursuits, though we know they exist, right? There's lots. Um, how do we go about making sure that when outdoor companies start to get involved and, and that, that outdoor community does get activated, that accessibility is a part of the plan, right? That when we go into, you know, create new wild space, or I don't want to say to create new wild spaces, but to protect certain spaces, you know, there's the, um, it's been the back and forth about bear's ears over the last few years and, and sort of these other kind of national monuments or forests, et cetera. Um, how do we go about making sure that accessibility is a, a major part of that? Yeah, I think, um, again, it um, having disabled people involved in that process and mm -hmm. seeking their opinion and their knowledge is really important. Um, and disabled folks bring more to the table than only, you know, ideas about disability and accessibility. Um, sure. You know, and I, of course, I want to avoid any broad strokes because, you know, people with disabilities are just as diverse as any other community. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, broadly speaking, I feel like um, you know, we do bring a certain level of creativity and um, mm. and flexibility and knowledge to the table that really benefits everyone, um, you know, in doing these projects. So, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I 100% agree with that. Um, and, you know, I think it's it's certainly not comparable, but it's it's very similar to the idea of, of any di diversity initiative and then expecting, you know, only putting that work on folks who may be black or Latinx and, and assuming that, yeah, they know all the answers, right? Because they're diverse right? and, mm -hmm. and assuming that um, the only purpose disabled folks would serve in any of those cases would be, oh, they're, they just, they tell us what's accessible or not, not that they have any other value in that. And so I think that's an important piece too. Um, and it, I think, I think you're right. You kind of mentioned at the beginning, it is a changing of a, of a culture, right? It's a changing of an understanding and um, and our perception of, of ability, right? And, and understanding that, um, you know, most disabled folks I know just, just want to engage in the outdoors, right? It just, <laughs> if, if that's, if that's their thing, or they just want to be able to try to do it. And so, um, you know, in your experiences in working with folks, I mean, what do you see is, particularly with the outdoors, what do you see as the benefit um, when folks do finally, are, are finally able to access at their, you know, at, with the supports that they might need? Yeah, um, you know, I think for me at least, um, and, you know, I want to kind of give a disclaimer that I don't necessarily want to like apply any like metaphorical meaning to engaging with nature or that being outdoors is going to be this epiphany experience or anything like that. It's not, it's, you know, it can be just as simple as, you know, I like to hang out outside, <laughs> which is totally valid. You mm -hmm. know, you don't have to go outdoors to have some epiphany experience. Yeah. Um, but for me, being outdoors in nature has really provided a sense of belonging that society has not given me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I go outdoors and I see the different ways that plants and animals exist and the resilience that they demonstrate in the outdoors and things like that, that has, you know, given me a sense of belonging and recognizing mm -hmm. that there are many different ways to be embodied and that, you know, everyone kind of has their role in the ecosystem and that is all just as valid. Yeah. I really like how you put that because um, that sort of goes to the the idea of philosophy of where I guess where humans, right, and broadly speaking, where we fit, sort of in this broader scope of things. Um, and I think oftentimes we we sort of think we're separate, right? We think we're we're um, we're off on our own, and and what we do has no interconnectedness with with these other aspects. And you know maybe that does get a little bit to what we were talking about a little bit earlier, this idea of, of defining natural spaces, right? Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes we do think that, you know, oh, 
outdoor spaces, natural spaces, that's, o that's over there. We contain them in national forests or state parks or what have you. And right, just looking out my window, right? There are plenty of trees, there's grass, there's animals that uh, inhabit any or all of them, right? And um, realizing that we are a part of that whole ecosystem, I think is, um, you know, maybe that's the shift we need in order to start thinking about accessibility, right? Yeah, yeah, there's this idea that there's the the built environment and the natural environment and never the two shall meet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not true at all. Um, yeah. you know, it's very much intertwined. Um, yeah. yeah, 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 we've been, our built and natural environment have been intertwined since the beginning, right? I mean, it's, it's never changed. Um, what advice do you have for those who want to get into, you know, either you know into nature or into doing sort of more outdoor type of activities, but they just don't know where to start, right? What what advice might you have for them? Yeah, I think um, again, I, I mentioned this earlier, but starting small um, mm. and whatever is the most accessible to you, um, and you know that may mean you know sitting on a bench in your uh, you know in your apartment community and just sitting yeah. outside. Um, it may mean, you know, taking the bus to the closest little city park, um, you know, and just starting there and figuring out, you know, what am I comfortable doing? What can my body do in the outdoors? Um, and then, you know, again, connecting with people, um, with other people doing this. Um, and, you know, there's lots of like trail app resources out there. Um, and most states have like a trails coalition that um, mm. often provides um, trail information on their website. So mm -hmm. doing some research around that and, you know, finding other hiking groups online that can provide information, um, you know, just, and I always kind of caution, like go into that with a bit of a, of an expectation that it's going to kind of suck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. And just be prepared for that. But yeah. Temper, temper expectations just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, when, when folks do go online or they look at, at, trail maps and you know obviously not ones that you have done they've gone really into depth but what should they look for if they're worried about um a trail maybe being too strenuous or or you know not necessarily maybe being outside of what they feel they could do at the moment yeah so i kind of look for a few basic uh features or information and that's the surface of the trail so if it's going to be paved or rock or gravel or dirt um, yeah. And then how steep the trail is, the elevation gain, the um, steepest grade on the trail, um, mm -hmm. which you know represents how steep any section of the trail is going to be. Yeah. Um, and then um, you know, are there places to rest on the trail, um, places to step off the trail if I need to, um, yeah. water, restrooms, things like that available. Yeah. Um Fantastic. And I guess I think this maybe is a, a little natural segue, but um, could you tell me a little bit about the guides you're, you're working with with Falcon um, in terms of you know, when could we expect them? What, what are we um, looking at? Yeah, um, I just finished the manuscript. Like, Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> Snaps for you. All right. Yeah, thank you. It's been a, an intense two-year project, mm -hmm. um, which was much more complicated by COVID and wildfire wildfires yes, and snowstorms absolutely. and you know this all of it that is, yeah <laughs> all of it just all of it 2021 2020 all of it just <laughs> absolutely yeah. yeah so um yeah so it's uh scheduled for publication in june of 2022 cool. and it covers all of like western washington and western oregon coast mm -hmm. um and there's i think almost 50 um, hikes in there, but it, it includes scenic drives and viewpoints and picnic areas and hikes and wheelchair accessible trails. So I really tried to provide um, a variety of options for people, you know, wherever they are and whatever their comfort and ability and experience levels are so that they have something available to them to try. Absolutely. That sounds wonderful. And um, I'm hoping that you continue this, right? Is that the plan? Are you are you planning to do more guides for other places in the country? Yeah, definitely. That's, Absolutely. that's the hope. <laughs> that's the hope. That's fantastic. I love to hear it. Um, well, Simon, I've I've enjoyed our conversation so much today. Um, 
uh, you've given me certainly a, a whole different perspective when we consider accessibility and, and particularly what we might need to do in what I guess we consider outdoor spaces. Um, I'd love to end with you telling us a little bit about what you're looking forward to, right? We've been going through this pandemic and everybody's sort of a little down, but so we need a little joy. So what are you, what are you excited about? What, um, you know, where are you going hiking next? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm actually leaving in a couple of weeks to drive cross country back to Florida, um, to spend um, a couple of months there visiting my folks and then coming back. So I'll be, you know, doing some stops and projects and events along the way. Um, so, you know, folks can definitely follow us um, for more information about that. Absolutely. And um, next year, I'm hoping to start doing um, more training programs and um, launching chapters of disabled hikers around the country, um, oh, very cool. training more disabled folks to, to do this work in their own communities. So oh, That's fantastic. I'd love to hear it. Um, well, again, Siren, I thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate our conversation. I hope those listening uh, enjoyed it as well. I'm sure they did. Um, you've given me so much to think about and I, I really do appreciate it. Oh, with that, um, we do have a question that popped in, um, which is fantastic. So Melly Bean 1718 said, which is Siren's favorite accessible hike in the North Cascades? And that's a great question. Mm, yeah. Um... So, I mean, of course I have to ask, and maybe if you want to speak to this, what does accessible mean for you? Are you asking for a wheelchair accessible trail or just kind of a quote unquote easy trail or? Yeah. Melly Bean, what are you looking for? Maybe. Maybe they're typing. <laughs> <laughs> the fun part about doing a live show. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess sort of what, um, I guess, what are some accessible hikes? I guess in terms of um, maybe if you can think of some that are a little easier on the easier end that maybe have some maybe not great or not not too tremendous of, of inclination changes. And then, um, you know, maybe some that might have a little bit more difficult. Okay, wheelchair, um, but also easy to get to. So that's what Melly's looking for. Yeah, I think there's a lot of trails around Mount Baker that are pretty accessible. Um, there's um, Artist Point, and of course these are have a really short hiking period, right? Because of winter yeah. and all of that. But um, Artist Point has some really nice accessible viewpoints and a trail. There's um, Picture Lake, Fire and Ice Trail, um, and then a little further south, open a little more uh, longer duration. There's um, Thunder Creek Trail um, out Highway 20 is really beautiful, and then there's um, a boardwalk short boardwalk trail called happy creek nature trail that is really nice so. yeah there you go melly that is that is a lot of recommendations so um i'll have to uh, i want to mention that um transcripts will be available so melly if you didn't catch it all that will be open for you so you can go back and read it um i know i certainly will and when i'm in the north uh, pacific northwest again i'm certainly going to reach out to you siren for some some good um some good options. You're very welcome, Millie. All right. With that, Siren, again, I thank you so much. It's been a wonderful conversation. Um, I loved having you here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I enjoyed all right. it. Cool. Uh, all right. So again, I'd like to thank our guest, Siren, for being the second guest in the series. We have two more conversations coming up this year, one in November and one in December. Head over to um, to find them, you can go to our website at dis, uh, dismove, etc. live to find it. Uh, in terms of finding information about Siren and the great work that they're doing, you can find more information at disabledhikers.com. You can also find them on Instagram or Facebook at disabledhikers, one word. If you're interested, you can also join uh, in their Facebook group. So they have a disabled hikers community in Facebook uh, or on Facebook, not in Facebook. And then you can find more information about the Disabled Hikers Guide to Western Washington and Oregon at their website, disabledhikers.com backslash the Disabled Hikers Guidebook. And I will make sure to put that in the show notes so that you have those links. 
Uh, if you'd like to support Siren and the work that they are doing, you can find them on Patreon at patreon.com slash Siren, S-Y-R-E-N. If you missed any part of today's conversation, feel free to watch the replay, which is going to be here on YouTube. I'm also going to be releasing each of these conversations as a podcast. The trailer is out. You can listen to that, subscribe to it. It's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and pretty much wherever else you'd find or listen to podcasts. As a reminder, this is our second conversation. If you want to find more information about the others, you can go to luma, lu.ma, backslash that hippie prof. And there are the other conversations that I will have uh, for the rest of the fall. Um, if you want to support the show and this one and, and some others that I'm working on, you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash that hippie prof. Um, I would really like to thank my friend, Adrian Doc Blust. He's the one who composed and put together the music that you heard at the beginning and that you're going to hear just a second from now. Uh, and lastly, I want to thank all of you watching live as well as listening to the broadcast. You're really the reason I'm here. And I'm glad and I hope you've enjoyed this conversation and I hope you'll enjoy, uh, join me next time. See you later. Hey, Siren. Hey. <laughs>